Good morning. My name is Brad Herman. I'm one of the pastors here at Applewood Baptist Church, and I always treasure the opportunity when I get to stand before you with the Word of God before us and to dive into it and see what God has for us today. We've been preaching through the Ten Commandments, God's law. Today we will look at the Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't know why I do the short stick, but I love this text. And no, I've not been thinking about adultery. <laughs> this is a very, very difficult and timely message. In 1990, the new report on sex, the Kinsey Institute reported that 37% of husbands and 29% of wives had at least one sex partner outside of marriage. But Atlanta psychiatrist Frank Pittman in his book, Private Lies, Infidelity, and the Betrayal of Intimacy suggests those figures are probably way too low. Surveys in recent years show that about 50% of husbands have been unfaithful, while about 30 to 40% of wives have been. Pittman reports in his book, this was in an article by the Los Angeles Times back in 1991. And I suggest to you, do you believe the moral decay of our country in these last 33 years have gone this or this? I suggest it's gotten worse. And these statistics are staggering. Adultery, consensual sexual intimacy where at least one of the participants is married. As I said before, this is a difficult message in light of what our culture is doing, in light of what our culture stands for. And I don't know who's in this room and what you believe, but today we are going to explore God's word, not Brad's, not a man's word on, a, on the issue of adultery, but let's see what God has for us related to adultery. The world is uh, defining adultery as removing it from our culture. There's no longer the stigma it used to have. Sexual pro, pro, uh, immorality and adultery is running rampant in our country. Some may disagree with scripture, and this sermon may seem archaic, out of touch, and irrelevant. But God's word says differently. God's word is perfect. It restores the soul. It's sure, it makes the wise simple. God's word rejoices the ear. It's pure, enlightening the eyes. It's clear, enduring forever. And true, they are righteous altogether. And keeping them, there is great reward. His words keep us from sin. God's word, per David, in Psalms 19, is perfect. It's sure, it's right, it's clean. It's eternal, it's transformational. It produces salvation, wisdom, joy, clarity, and direction. It is eternal. It has great reward. God's word is revelation of himself, and through it we see who he is. He is holy. He is loving, gracious, merciful, and wise. He knows all. He's just. He's eternal. He's invitational. I wanted to set a foundation before we dive into this text so that we get our compass facing north. The compass is facing towards God's word. Some of the things that are said to here is going to be countercultural. It's going to fly in the face of your neighbors. It's going to fly in the face of your friends and maybe your relatives. But our compass is faced north on God's word. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20, verse 14. The main idea of today's message is the seventh commandment protects God's design for marriage. Point number one, marriage completes and makes creation very good. Creation was good. God spoke it, and it was good. Sometimes we use the word kind of lazily, and we'll say, man, those pancakes were really good. And, and, and so our English language doesn't really capture what it means in Genesis chapter one and two, that it was good. It was perfect. It was holy. It was without blemish. It was the perfect home for man and wife to walk with a holy God. 
I can't even imagine what that would be like. My mind is so deluded with what I walk around here. I can't put together the pieces on what good meant to God in Genesis when he says it was good. And then he said at the end of it in the sixth day of creation, he said it is very good. And what happened on the sixth day of creation? He created marriage. He created man. He put man asleep. He took a rib. He made woman. He brought the man to woman. He says, Adam, meet Eve. Eve, meet Adam. And he married them. And they became one flesh. And at the conclusion of this, God says, it is very good. Marriage made creation very, it was the crowning jewel of creation. Marriage is very good. Sexual intimacy within marriage is very good. I like that. I agree. I'm glad God made sexual intimacy very good within marriage. Marriage is also a gift to humanity. Marriage makes life better. If your marriage does not make your life better, you need to find the owner's manual and review it. Marriage makes life better with a partner, with a lover, with a teammate, with someone to help you make decisions. Marriage is very, very good. God had a plan for marriage, and we need to adhere to that. Marriage is designed for one man and one woman. This is where it gets difficult. In a lot of pulpits, they shy away from this. But let me be clear. The Bible is clear. In Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 22, we read, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman. And we have in our neighborhoods placards in front yard to say, love is love. That's code for I can do whatever I want to with whomever I want to, with whatever I want to. That's not God's plan. God made it good. And let me tell you something. When we adhere to the goodness of God and his plan, related to marriage or in that fact in anything that he tells us our lives are better God is good God is the creator God knows what best I know this is not popular but it is God's word God's truth God's plan for marriage as God's people we need to be faithful to God's word even if it costs some of you here will leave and you will agree with God's word some of you don't and you may go home and you have neighbors. And I'm not saying you bang on the door because I got a placard that says, Take explain to me what love is love means. But your marriage should be a testimony to those around you. If you have a godly marriage, you are on stage for display of what God loves mankind. In Ephesians, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. If a man and a woman are joined in one flesh and they know Jesus Christ is their Savior, it's going to exemplify the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are going to display everywhere they go the gospel. The man is going to sit at Jesus' feet. The man is going to lead his wife and love his wife to the point he gives his life. He will consider, he will love her. And the Bible says that a woman needs to follow her husband. That's easy to do if the man is following Christ and the man is loving his wife. And it becomes a display of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brad, my marriage is on the rocks. Can you share with me what makes your marriage tick? Oh, yeah, Fred, come on in. Let me share what that is. It's that my marriage is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without him, it can't be what you see. By the way, Fred, have you ever considered Jesus Christ? 
Marriage is good. God's plan for marriage is good. It helps humanity. It proclaims the gospel. And his design is for one man and one woman, even if it costs. You may stand for the word, and I trust and encourage you to do so, but there's a cost associated oftentimes. You may lose a friend. You may lose a position. You may lose your reputation for standing what is true. Our culture is in a spiral going down because we, the church, is not doing that. We would rather walk by instead of standing for Christ. The Bible says, the world hated me. And this is Jesus speaking to disciples. You know that if it hated me, it's going to hate you. In 2 Timothy, it says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be prosecuted, persecuted. In our case, may be prosecuted. Where will you be when that moment comes? We need to stand for God's word. It's eternal. And if we don't, we find ourselves on the fast track of we are where we are headed now. Marriage designed by the heart of God is to be protected, guarded for our benefit and his glory. Marriage is important. Very, very important. Jesus Christ's total focus when he walked on this planet was his bride. For 33 years he walked and he was never distracted. He never varied. He was headed to the cross to give his life for his bride. Husbands, I challenge you, is that you? Point number two. Adultery destroys marriage. Adultery attacks and destroys God's best, that is marriage in creation. Adultery reveals a rebellious heart against God's word. Adultery destroys relationships. Adultery destroys testimonies. Adultery destroys the picture of the gospel. Adultery destroys the body, and adultery destroys the soul. The Bible gives us a wonderful example of these truths in the man David. And we all love David. I love David. David was a man's man. This same David that we're going to look at in 2 Samuel 11 slayed Goliath as a youth with a slingshot. He killed lions and bears as he was shepherding in the fields. God chose David to lead the people of Israel to be their king. God chose David to the lineage of the Messiah. God set David up. This David, whom we all know and love, When I mention his name, what comes to your mind? Chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers, and he took her. And when she came to him, he laid with her. The woman conceived. And in verse 27b, we read these words. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. We spent spent the onset of this message talking about the goodness of God in marriage. And now we see that adultery is evil. Adultery has cost. You don't play with sin and not get burned. And here we have David. If you know the whole story, you can lay out the whole Ten Commandments and just in this whole episode with Bathsheba and just check, 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 guilty, guilty, guilty. He was a liar. He was a thief. He was a murderer. He was a betrayer. And he committed adultery and tried to hide it. Guilty, 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 guilty. And there was a cost for it. In Psalms 51, we're going to read a few verses here, and I'm going to display the cost of sin in one's life. <clears throat> David, in his prayer of repentance, says this, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and when you judge. 
Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have spoken rejoice. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. We're going to deconstruct what David said there and examine where David was at in this prayer. The above pictures a man destroyed by his sin, adultery. His sin was ever before him. It was haunting him. You ever did something that it just wouldn't leave you alone? That you could not rest from it? You could not hide from it? And the world will take a drug or an alcohol or something to get away from that sin, but it's ever before them until they become so calloused, so addicted that they're able to sleep again. David was sick because his sin was ever before him. He had broken bones metaphorically, which means he was sick. This, this condition of unrepentant sin was eating David alive. Physically, he was broken. Emotionally, he was broken. Spiritually, he was scared to death. He's afraid God was going to walk away from him, remove his spirit from him. David says, oh, even the joy that I had, the gladness that I had, all of it is gone. Sin does that. You don't toy with sin. You don't toy with adultery. Was David restored? Absolutely. We're going to get to that in a few moments of how that process happened. <clears throat> But make no mistake, if you play with sin, if you play with adultery, it's going to mess your life up forever. It's going to mess your family's life up. Continue to read about David's legacy and the whole problem with Absalom. It was just a, it was a dumpster fire because of adultery. David knew. He repented. And God restored. The seventh commandment shall, is, shall, shall not commit adultery. It's from God's word and should be taken seriously. Guard your hearts from it. Let me give you some practical biblical guidelines for God's people related to adultery. And I say God's people because God's people has transformed their hearts. And they're able and empowered to do the things that God instructs us to do. And it makes sense and logic because he owns your heart. There's two areas that we need to protect our lives with. The first area is thought. The second area is actions. People, guard your hearts by guarding your minds. What do I mean by that? I mean, be careful what you look at. Be careful. I was watching the Olympics. And Beyonce, I don't know who she is, but it said Beyonce. And they should have called her Bouncy. Because she bounced onto the screen and red, white, and blue, if you could find it, scantily covered with, it was, it was dishonoring to God. And she had a seductive smile on her face. And she was advertising the Olympics. I'm a man. I don't know how a woman thinks, but I know how a man thinks. I'm one. And I had to do Job 31 and remember the covenant I made with my eyes. I go to Bear Creek Lake with my grandchildren to paddleboard. It's a great place. You cannot believe what's running around there. I need to wear not blinders or not sunglasses, but blinders and just say, show me the water. Get me on the water. Let me paddleboard and get out of there. There is scantily clad women everywhere. Guys, I know this is our culture. You need to guard your hearts. You need to protect what goes in here that lives here. And we're going to see why in a moment. You need to guard what you listen to. I have heard it said in some types of music, I won't bring it up specifically, but it is verbal porn. What are you listening to? Is it building you up or is it planting seeds in your heart? We're going to talk about the danger of that in a moment. Who do you associate with? What are you hearing from them? What are their lifestyles about? 
Are you proclaiming the gospel and saying, no, that's wrong? Or are you saying, huh, be careful what you look at, what you listen to, what you do, and where you go? The second one is our actions. And we're going to get down in the mud here for a minute. If you could say this has any mud in it, and it doesn't. But God says, honor your marriages. They belong to him for his testimony. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Quit depriving yourselves of sexual intimacy. It opens the door for Satan. That's not Brad speaking. It says that in the very next sentence, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Do you realize you play games like that and you are cracking the door of your husband or your wife's life for Satan to get in and wreak havoc? Your life related to sexual intimacy with your husband or your wife can be a tool of Satan. In some aspects, my actions can affect my wife's fidelity and vice versa. I need to protect that. I need to guard that. I need to honor my marriage. Don't play games with intimacy. It is a gift from God for one flesh to bring joy, to bring a, a, an image of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make your life better. It's not designed or given to us by God to be a tool, to be a weapon, or to be a bargaining chip. What God made is good. Let's treat it that way. Arthur Pink, who is no longer with us, but a great theologian, in his exposition on the Sermon on the Mount, made this observation. This might sting. If lustful looking is so grievous a sin, then those who dress and expose themselves with desires to be looked at and lusted after are not less but possibly even more guilty. In this matter, it is often that men are caused to sin and women tempt them to do so. How great then must be the guilt of the great majority of the modern misses who deliberately seek to arouse sexual passions from men. And how much greater still is the guilt of most of their mothers for calling them and training them to do so. People, this is God's pulpit. And we're gonna teach God's word. And God's word says, guard your marriages. Honor your marriages. Act appropriately when it comes to sex. We're not to be anger in marriage. In Genesis, or Ephesians chapter 4, it says, don't let the sun go down on anger. I have found in my life that I'm guilty of this. I can be angry and not even let her know about it. And I go home, I go to bed at night, and bitterness starts to creep in. And my star heart starts to thrive on that. And I wake up the next morning and brick has been laid. And if not addressed, another brick has been laid. And another and another. And before you know it, I got a wall. All because I let anger fester in my heart. Instead of coming to my wife and saying, sweetie, we need to talk. And more often than not, in our case, I'm the one who has to say, I was wrong Will you forgive me? How many times in your marriage, guys and gals, have you uttered those words? Will you forgive me? Conversely, the Bible gives us instructions that we are to let the word of God richly dwell within us. This is the solution for Christians to be able to apply some of the principles Biblically, we just discussed. When we let the word of God richly dwell within us, that means dwell, I live with that thing. 
I live with that thought. I live with that reality of Scripture. It becomes my friend. I know it. It knows me. And we live and dwell not just together. We dwell richly together. It becomes the essence of who I am. This book, God's desire for me to know him is in this book. And when it dwells richer than me, it changes me. It changes the way I lead. It changes the way I love. It changes the way I minister. It changes the way I treat my grand. It changes me. It makes it easy for me to say, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look. Guys, gals, we need to take marriage seriously and adultery seriously. It dishonors God. It destroys our lives And the world says, who's your God? You're not any different. You believe just like us. We have seen God's plan for marriage that is very good. We have seen that adultery is very bad. It destroys God's goodness and it destroys our lives. Let's look at the purpose of God's law. Point number three. The Ten Commandments displays God's grace in our hearts. Most of the world looks at the Ten Commandments, and at first glance, you can kind of see where they're coming from, and they say, God's law is vindictive, judgmental. He's a cosmic killjoy. But that's not the truth. The truth is the law shines God's light on our lives so that we can sense and know we need a savior. Why do I say that? Because God is holy. God is just. God is perfect. God has no blame, no blemish. That's who he is. We sang about it. That's who he is. And Jesus Christ said in Matthew, be holy as I am holy. God has a standard, and we don't meet it. God's law reveals the condition of our heart that it's rebellious, that it's wicked, that it's evil. Man, we don't hear that much. Deceitfully wicked. I wish I could sugarcoat this because I don't like swallowing that pill either. I'd like to sprinkle sugar on it, something to make it taste a little better, but I can't. That's who we are. Jesus Christ expanded on that, on this very commandment in Matthew 28. When he says, you have heard it, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman in lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. What is he saying? He's saying the actions are not what you're guilty of. The actual act is from the root of your heart. The issue is your heart, not the actions. The immoral desire of adultery already lived in your heart. Sin in the heart causes lustful looking. Lustful looking doesn't cause the sin in your heart. It was already rooted and living there. Jesus is saying the heart is where the sin lives. People think the law is judgmental and they scream against it. Listen to me. The law is not screaming at sinners to stop sinning. The law is screaming, you can't stop This is who you are. It was the gracious act of God to give us the law so we can see who we are. And in so seeing who we are measured against the law in our hearts, we come to a verdict that we're wrong and we're wretched and we're hopeless and we're helpless. Guilty, guilty, guilty. As with murder, we learned last week, the issue is anger in the heart. That's the issue. 
with adultery today per Jesus Christ, it says, lust in the heart is the issue. The issue is the heart. Per Jesus' indictment, we are all guilty of murder and adultery. And if we looked at the other eight commandments, it'd be guilty, guilty, guilty. Brad Herman is guilty of murder. I'm guilty of adultery because these sins live in my heart. In Proverbs 4.24, it says, the heart is the wellspring of life. Whatever is in your heart will bubble out. You might be able to wear a mask for a while, but it will bubble out. And your heart is deceitful. God is a holy God, and he does not tolerate sin because of that holiness. And like I mentioned before, therefore, your heavenly Father is perfect, and you shall be perfect as well. We got a problem, guys. The law condemns us. The law shows us that we cannot change. And I know you've tried it, I've tried it, but the heart still is wicked. And I can rein in my behaviors. And when we rein in our behaviors to the point that we don't manifest our heart on the outside, you know what they call that? A Pharisee. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus Christ says, you're whitewashed on the outside. You act good, but on the inside, you have dead man's bones. Why? Because their hearts were not addressed. The heart is the issue. The heart is my issue. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God is his expectations and his creation in us, and we fall short. We are just dripping in sin. And it's dripping from our hearts. God's a just God. And he has to deal with sin because he's holy. You have to be holy because he's holy. And he says, for the wages of sin is death. It just keeps getting worse and worse, doesn't it? Romans 3.20 says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. It don't matter how good you are. God says, it doesn't make an impact on me because I know your heart and it's deceitful. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. There's the grace of God through the law. He's introduced you to you. You are a sinner. If you don't believe me, go to the law and just check, check, check. check. And it's all in the heart. That's where your sin comes from, the heart. And God was so good, he showed that to you. He showed you who you are and that you can't fix yourself. My heart is the problem. What can change my heart? I can't. I've tried. I can act. I can pretend. But the heart is festering with evil and wickedness. In Romans chapter 7, Paul went through this process. He says, the things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I do do. And he concludes that chapter with these words, O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? That's what the law is intended to do, to bring us to the point where, oh, wretched man that I am, I have no hope. What am I going to do? My heart is broken. It's sick. It's evil. It's vile. And as hard as I try, I cannot change it. And I could dismiss now and have a prayer, and you'd have a terrible day. Because it's doomsday. But the good news is coming. God says, I can fix your heart. I can change you. I can make you new through the gospel of Jesus Christ. God says there's a remedy I can fix your heart. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's code for Jesus Christ came into the world to change your heart. And that's what he does through his blood on the cross. Can God and will God forgive adultery? Absolutely. Murder? Absolutely. All the other eight commandments? Absolutely. But it starts with his blood being spilled on you forgiving you of your sin, making you new. 
We see this in Psalms. We talked about David, and we see that God restored David. Well, God, or David had a repentant heart, and he says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Wash me, return to me the joy of my salvation. I want, I'm wrong, forgive me, wash me. And Jesus Christ's future death was the promise that David's prayer would be answered. Redemption, the remedy, For sin is Jesus Christ, and David is our example. And Brad is an example. And most of you out there are an example as you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. God made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God by Jesus Christ's sacrificial Death on the cross for me. And he says, I become the righteousness of God. What's that code for? That means I become perfect. I'm now blameless. I can now meet the requirements of God that I am perfect and you need to be perfect. If you want relationship with me, I can now do that because through Jesus Christ, I have his righteousness. Am I perfect? Talk to my wife. I'm far, far from it. But God has changed my heart He's changed my life, and I'm on the road to becoming the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the answer to Paul's scream, O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this curse? Jesus Christ, the gospel, can release you from that curse. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel is very clear. The gospel is very powerful. When we confess our sins and make him Lord of our lives, he owns our heart. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore now we are new creatures in him. New creatures, what does that mean? He's changed our hearts. We're moving in a righteous direction because we love him. We adore him, we praise him. How great is our God? His law indicts us. It drives us to repentance and then provides a remedy for our sins in Jesus Christ. God's word is perfect. His creation was perfect and he wants to redeem his greatest man and wife back to where they can walk with him forever. The gospel of Jesus Christ does that.